Thank you, Michael. Well, I want to keep it very quick uh, and somehow explain and walk through a path to degrowth in overdeveloped countries uh, in, in a very small amount of time so we have enough time for Q&A and uh, can get to the many panels uh, and panelists' uh, editions today. Uh, but I want to start quickly with uh, the elephant in the room whenever I talk about degrowth. There's uh, a fundamental myth in this country and in many economies around the world that infinite, infinite economic growth is good. Uh, but I hope no one still uh, believes that that is possible on a finite planet. Uh, and in fact, uh, I think the best way I've seen that uh, made clear uh, is a little one-minute cartoon by the New Economics Foundation that applied the same economic philosophy to a hamster. Uh, if a hamster grew uh, at the same uh, rate as it does as an infant, as it continues to develop throughout uh, its adulthood, uh, within just over a year, the hamster would consume the entire planet. Uh, and we are doing the same thing with our economy. Uh, unfortunately, this clicker is really... Can you wind it back? I'm going to ask Michael, my co-director, to be my uh, hand here. Uh, one more. Yeah. So we're unfortunately doing the same thing uh, as a species, not as quickly as that hamster, uh, but right now we're using 1.5 planet's worth of uh, biocapacity every year. Uh, of course, uh, we don't have one and a half planets, uh, but uh, another way to say this is looking at it from the opposite perspective. This is the same footprint flipped over, where we only have one planet. Right now, uh, by, with the level of consumption that we have, the Earth could only sustain about five billion people. Uh, if everyone consumed like an American, we could only sustain a fifth of our population, 1.4 billion people. But what's interesting is when you do this math, even at medium levels of consumption, we can only sustain 6.2 billion people. What's a medium level of consumption? Five to six thousand dollars per person per year of economic throughput. So obviously, if we are going to get to a level where we are equitably distributing wealth so that people don't uh, suffer through poverty, uh, we're going to have to degrow in overdeveloped countries. But the question, of course, what is degrowth? And uh, I give a more elaborate des description in the chapter, but essentially it's the abandonment first and foremost of this uh, myth of, of perpetual growth and the controlled contraction of economies to return within their ecological limits. Uh, you've probably heard the term steady state economy, and that's ultimately the endpoint goal. But we are so far beyond ecological capacity that America or even European economies can't just switch over to a steady state economy tomorrow, even if there was the political will. But first, we have to undergo a, a process of degrowth. It's what the degrowth thinker, Sergei Latouche, calls uh, a, a planned diet, right? We often think of uh, confused degrowth with a recession, but in reality, one, the first, degrowth, is a planned diet, while the second is uh, essentially forced starvation. Uh, so we need to go through this process of degrowth ourselves. Uh, and, and let's be clear, there are, it's, this is not just something that we have to do. Just like with a diet, there are some significant benefits. You have more energy, uh, you, you can walk up that flight of stairs, uh, you don't die as early. Uh, you know, these are clear benefits of, of, of dieting. And, and we have a similar thing going on with uh, a so social system. By degrowing, we are going to reduce obesity. I mean, there's an actual link between diet and, and degrowth here, where two-thirds of, of American population is overweight or obese. Now we're hitting two billion individuals worldwide suffering from overweight or obesity. Uh, we have debt, uh, higher debt loads, as Michael was saying. Uh, more of us are addicted to pharmaceuticals in part because of our ill health, our sedentary lifestyle. We're stuck in traffic. You name it. There are a lot of societal ills that are coming out from being obsessed with uh, consumption and, and, and continued growth. 
So let me just walk through very quickly what I would say are the four key steps on the path to degrowth. Uh, go ahead. Uh, the, the first, of course, is this idea of transforming a consumer culture. Uh, we are trapped in a, in a system that stimulates more and more consumption. Uh, and, and we are going to need to walk away from certain cultural norms, whether we're talking about a very uh, meat-centric diet, whether we're talking about driving, whether we're talking about private pet ownership, uh, we, we can't sustain this level of consumption uh, when we have 7 billion people and, uh, and a projected up to 9 billion people. Although hopefully, Bob, uh, later in the panels will convey how we will stop before 9 billion. Uh, go ahead. Uh, the second, of course, is redistribute tax burdens. Michael already mentioned the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, and, and focusing on the 1%. Absolutely, this is essential. And in fact, the good news is that uh, there are times in even American history where taxes on the wealthiest have been much higher. In, during World War II, the marginal tax rate on those earning over $200,000 was 94%. So, so we can find the political will again, uh, I hope. Uh, and it would be behoove us to actually study how we did that then. Uh, but we also, recognizing that we have to get down to five or $6,000 per person, we have to not just tax more the 1%, but the 21%, the 41%, even the 61%, uh, as well as a whole slew of societal ills like pollution, like disposables, like junk food. Uh, you go down the line, flying, baby formula. There's a lot of things that are pushing us in the wrong way, and taxes are really powerful tool to get us back in the, in the right direction. Go ahead. Uh, and of course, with all that new tax revenue, what would we do with it? Uh, first, of course, we can pay our debt as a country. That would be nice. And then we can start uh, facilitating this transition to a degrowth and, and a sustainable and prosperous society. Uh, number one, we can help facilitate a transition uh, and help with job retraining, uh, which is a key piece of the puzzle. Two, we can actually start funding public goods again, rebuild our, our decaying water infrastructure, build a walkable uh, infrastructure filled with metros and, and rapid bus systems and bike sharing, uh, as you see now around DC. Uh, even really creative things like libraries and, and facilitating people to move back to, to borrowing books instead of buying books. Uh, what, this image in the, in the bottom right corner is actually a library right in a metro stop in Madrid so that on your way to work you can stop and you can pick up a book that you've ordered the, the day before online and, and just head on right on to work. That kind of innovative way to facilitate getting easy access to public goods is something that we're barely looking at in part because we are undervaluing those goods. So uh, along with facilitating public goods and, and increasing that, we also have to recognize that there are ecological changes built into the process now. There's no way we avoid certain things. Uh, in fact, last year, uh, the U.S. suffered from 12 uh, natural disasters that cost each over a billion dollars. It cost the American government $52 billion in dealing with these. Uh, and so if we're not starting to build in, you know, no pun intended, but a rainy day fund to deal with uh, these disasters, we are going to end up letting the communities fend for themselves who, who deal with this. Uh, more proactively, uh, governments like the Netherlands is actually putting a billion dollars a year into preparing over a course of 200 years uh, for a, an increase in two degrees. They're rebuilding their dikes, they're, they're dismantling hotels on the coasts and uh, replacing them with uh, dikes and fl floodlands. Uh, they're really thinking ahead. Uh, which is going to take resources. Uh, along with uh, tax burdens, we also have to better share and redistribute uh, job hours. Uh, and this can happen in you know, obvious ways. For example, uh, shortening the work week. Uh, only our culture says that the 40-hour work week is normal. Uh, I think many of us in the room would be okay if our culture said 20 hours a week is normal. Uh, and in some countries, like the UK, They've done studies that show that if you actually add up 
all the employed individuals, the unemployed, the overemployed, the underemployed, and average out their work week, it hits 21 hours. So just a better redistribution of, of work could provide a lot more of the basic goods for a lot lar larger number of people, while also pulling out some of that discretionary income. Add to that uh, longer maternity and paternity leave uh, and vacation hours. Uh, Sweden, for example, grants 480 days of uh, parental leave per couple. Uh, so you know, adding that in and you suddenly have a much shorter working span. Uh, so, and that can really help to better redistribute wealth and uh, opportunity while also helping in this degrowth process. Uh, and having less work each week would also free you up to become, at an individual level, more economically resilient. Uh, a, a, an idea of more self-provisioning, what Juliet Shore calls a plenitude economy. Uh, that it, it takes form in different ways, as simple as realizing you have time not to waste el electricity and money on drying your clothes in the dryer, but in, in, on, on the clothesline, whether that's turning your lawn that's right now absorbing pesticides and fertilizers into your own little uh, garden, uh, raising chickens, making a little community tool library to share so that people don't end up owning all these tools that they use once a year, uh, and on and on. And that ends up doing two things. One, it reduces your overall consumption while maintaining a high quality of life, but also increasing your own family's economic resiliency, right? I might be a master after 10 years at World Watch of using Excel, but this might be a skill that becomes very useless very quickly in this uh, transition that Bob was hinting at uh, in his talk, right? But if I'm doing that and at the same time I've learned gardening skills, I, I have a barterable skill in my community, we have a shared community capital where we can trade tools and, and skills and all of that, that gives me and my family a much a deeper level of, of resiliency. Uh, but of course it does take time. Uh, and it also takes education and marketing. Right? Marketing has brought us here to some level through the almost half a trillion dollars a year spent uh, selling us consumer goods. But it also can have a really important role in getting us to a plenitude economy and getting us to a degrowth uh, model. In fact, in, the, in World War II, the U.S. government actively marketed and encouraged people to start creating victory gardens, to start converting their lawns into gardens, and ended up enabling 40% of household vegetable consumption coming from household gardens and community gardens. Uh, and that was through some very sophisticated social marketing. Uh, and, and that needs to happen again. And in fact, that new tax revenue can facilitate that process, helping to re-educate communities, give them the training that they need, help normalize new trends like multi-generational housing. Uh, the, the recession has ended up increasing people living in multi-generational houses uh, and, and households by 10%. And that has ended up providing a lot more economic security to those households. Even though those uh, households' incomes are lower in a median uh, measurement, uh, their, their poverty levels are actually also lower. So they're doing more with less. Uh, and that enables more kind of the, the use of generations, uh, the elders taking care of the children, the children, or the grandchildren, I should, should say, the grandchildren stimulating the elders to keep them ener energized and, and healthy, uh, helping to keep uh, them out of nursing homes in, in some level. Uh, so there's a real opportunity to, to facilitate these, these transitions that will not just improve our quality of life, but also to help facilitate degrowth. And I think that those four key steps, and those aren't the only, of course, and, and those are the very short version of them, uh, but those will help us to get closer to true development, uh, that, what, uh, that sustainable, sustainability sweet spot that uh, Michael was describing, where the ecological uh, footprint is low, but the, the uh, development index is high uh, through and, and bring uh, more of, of the world's population into that zone. Uh, because ultimately, we are going to have to degrow 
one way or the other, but the, the goal, in my mind, is that we do it proactively rather than being forced into a contracted model because of the changing Earth's systems. So thank you. I'm going to leave it there.